right. So um, I think we are live and good to go now. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Alicia and uh, welcome to this week's webinar where we'll be talking about um, the speaking part of the um, OET and looking at one particular aspect, which is um, the speaking criteria. So let me just make sure that we're all set up and then we can start, give a few more people a few more minutes to join and then we'll get going. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I must admit the last time I had a few minutes, uh, a, a few problems seeing people actually um, chatting with me. So I wanna make sure this time that I, and now I'm seeing you guys. Good morning, everyone, wonderful. Last time I had a few tech problems, this time I'm good to go. So good morning, I see people, let's see who we've got here. Um, honey, good morning, honey. Good morning, um, Buer. Um, good morning from Saudi Arabia. Divya, where are you guys from? Okay, I see somebody from the Philippines. So it's the afternoon there. Hello, Kudel. Um, Divya is from Saudi Arabia. Where are you guys from? Because hmm? I am sitting, I'm sitting here in Northern Germany. So right now here, it is nice and fresh at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, let me scroll down some more. Philippines, Afghanistan, Hamidullah, Mansu. Hello, Hamidullah. What, what's the weather like in Afghanistan? What time is it in Afghanistan? Ooh, don't know. Hmm. Um, I am from someone's asking where I'm from. You mean where I'm sitting now, where I live, or where I'm from originally? Right now, I live in Germany, where I have been living for many years, but I originally come from Barbados in the Caribbean, all the way on the other side of the world. Um, completely different weather, <sighs> completely different language. My native language, of course, is English. Um, but um, I speak German as my second language. So we've got from India, Iraq. Yeah, I'm from Northern Germany, I'm in Northern Germany. Zimbabwe watching in Algeria. You see, this is why I absolutely love, um, what should I say? Well, it's the part of social media that I love the fact that so many people can connect. Um, it's the part of my job that I love because my students can start out in Tokyo and end up in um, Argentina at any particular, in any particular 24 hours, it's lovely. Pakistan, United um, Arab Emirates, wow. New Zealand, and it's evening there. Thank you, Penning, for staying awake for this. Um, okay, Myanmar, I hope you're staying safe there. Singapore, um, good, wonderful. Wow, Muscat, wow. Okay, Bangkok, excellent. Okay, guys. So now we've introduced um, everyone, well, I've introduced myself to everyone so far. Um, how are you guys, anyone, just type in there and give me an idea of some of the challenges that you have with speaking. I am going to do that before I start talking about what my topic is today, all right? So I'm just gonna spend five minutes. I wanna hear you guys, you tell me 
what specific challenges you are having with the speaking part. And I'll address those first. So let's see. Uh huh. Oop. Oop. No one managed to write in yet. Oh, there's a delay. Okay. So anyone write in, just tell me about any challenge that you're having um, with the speaking, for example, we know the speaking criteria. Um, of course, there's always grammar and vocabulary, which challenges people how to improve that. Um, there's appropriateness of language. Um, are you using the right language for your speaker, for your um, speaking partner, for your patient or caregiver? Um, fluency, which is my pet peeve, because I must say, I find a lot of the times um, students really need help on the, the best ways to actually improve their fluency. Um, and there are techniques to actually help you improve your fluency, techniques beyond just learning gra grammar and vocabulary. Okay. Um, oh, Vincent is telling me that it's summer in the Philippines. Oh, you lucky devil. Okay. Um, oops, somebody's got a blackout. Oh, so sorry. All right, let's see. Well, we've got one person here who's anxious because their exam, Shuvo, your exam is on the 29th, so you're anxious. Here's the thing about anxiety. It's good because it gets the adrenaline pumping. It puts you in that fight mode. But don't get over anxious because when your mind is too anxious, you don't think clearly. You don't. One of the biggest pieces of advice that I give my students right before their exam is this. Get a good night's sleep. Go to bed early. Sleep eight hours, wake up the next morning fresh. Staying up late at night sounds like a great idea. Um, staying up, you know, it's not. For several reasons. One, you don't get enough sleep. But the other reason is that actually as you sleep, your brain is cleansing itself. It's refreshing itself. It is actually learning and reconsolidating and remembering things at a subconscious level. So a good night's sleep rather than staying up late at night is the best thing you can do for your performance on exam day. Okay. Um, who else? I usually have the fillers. How to get rid of it. Good for you. Time management in the speaking. Yeah. Um, the good thing about time management, however, does anyone out there, for example, set an alarm clock in the morning to get up? What you might find after a while is that, say you set your alarm to wake up at six o'clock. Um, yes, some people still have a problem, but after a while, your body kind of switches on and just before six o'clock, you open your eyes anyway. Or for those of you, for example, who like cooking, when you first started cooking, you have to set the timer for 20 minutes or an hour or whatever. But then after a while, if you do it regularly, you put the cake or whatever in the oven and then you go off doing something and then a little internal clock says, oh, it should be time. The same thing happens with practice in speaking. At first, you know, is it five minutes? Is it less than five minutes? But with practice, you develop that internal clock of, okay, how much time has passed? It does happen. What you need to do in your speaking, however, whether you're speaking with your teacher or whether you're speaking, practicing with a partner is always set the clock. Set the clock for the three minutes preparation time, set the clock for the five minutes. Same thing for your writing. Same thing actually for all the subtests. And after a while, your rhythm suits itself to the time because subconsciously it knows the timer is going to go off. Okay. Grammatical errors. Yes, that is a whole topic with my students. So much so that I've developed a whole topic 
a, a, a whole course to help them um, with their grammar, um, learning in context. You learn best when you learn in context. Um, what to say if you're unsure or unfamiliar with a topic? Any ideas to make conversations flow nicely? Um, Janica, that is actually a really good um, point that you brought up because people get a lot of anxiety because say it's a dermatology topic and they've never dealt with dermatology before or it's a psychiatric topic and they are not comfortable with emotional or mental issues. First of all, remember, OET is not testing your medical or technical knowledge. Let me repeat that. We are not testing your professional knowledge. What is being tested is your English. And with respect to the speaking, and also the writing, now I think about it, but with respect to the speaking, all the information you actually need to talk about, especially any technical information, is on the role play card. So you don't have to think, oh, I don't know anything about dermatitis or seborrhea. What am I going to say? Don't worry about it. Your focus is in the communication skills. Are you greeting the patient correctly? Are you, well, reading comprehension? Are you understanding? What is the scenario? What are the points you are supposed to bring up? Okay, are you um, linking your ideas smoothly, flowing from one topic to the next? And remember, you do not have to flow exactly as in the, the role play card. Use your skill to answer the person and then bring it back on stream to what you want to introduce next. It has to do with how you use those three minutes. Use your three minutes preparation time to not just understand the scenario, but also to maybe underline and, and write a few little words on the paper to help um, trigger in your mind, okay, they're triggers, okay. When it comes to this, this is a word or three words that I want to include in what I'm saying. It's kind of preempts your mind and you can jump right into it. So practice with that three minutes, okay? Um, vocabulary. Um, grammar on organizing your thoughts, Ma. Um, yeah. Once again, that comes with practice. Vocabulary and grammar are actually a little bit longer to build because that's brain conditioning, knowing what to say at the time you have to say it. Um, but organizing your thoughts, you can pick up a, use that three minutes to get yourself a rhythm. Um, and, and practice that rhythm so that when you're on the spot in the exam, you get into it quickly. You just do, 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 go through your steps that you practice and you're ready, okay? Um, fluency, again, that comes up a lot. Um, fluency goes a bit beyond just knowing grammar um, and vocabulary. There are techniques for improving your fluency. Um, yeah, difficulty in organizing thoughts. So basically we're seeing, um, <laughs> Maya is saying, um, Maya has a challenge the night before an exam trying to get to bed at 8 p.m. Yeah. All I can do is once again, getting your body into the rhythm and, and you know what, find out what, what do you usually do to calm yourself down to relax? Is it listen to music? Is it watch a movie? Is it go for a walk? Is it just sitting outside and looking at the stars? Do that right before you go into bed. Don't just go from full power and then into bed because your mind will be restless. Take a transition into doing something that helps you to calm down, that helps you to unwind, and then go to bed, okay? All right. All right. So we've got tons of suggestions here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to now um, talk to you about what I um, had planned for today. And then we'll go back to you guys. And I'm going to pick right back up and start answering your questions. Okay.
All right. So give me one second while I open my presentation here and I screen share. And go right back up to the top. Excellent. And I think you're going to see my lovely little bird. Yes, you do. You see my lovely little bird. And then, oops. Yeah. So there we go. All right. So unfortunately, in this mode, um, in this mode, I can't really see you guys comments, but this presentation today is going to be really short and concise because I, I, I really want to focus more on um, you guys. So oops, let me just move this across, move, get it out the way. Okay. My quick topic, but you can still during my presentation, you can still continue um, to um, put in questions because I'm, I'm going to go back and look at them. Okay. Um, the focus I wanted to give today is on tone and basically impressing the examiners with your tone. And when I say tone, I don't mean being overly dramatic. I mean the natural um, highs and lows of English. Um, and you'll see why that is important. So first of all, why is tone important to you or to the examiners and therefore to you? The criteria that tone would come under are these two. First of all, appropriateness of language. That's a big criteria, it's six points. You do not want to be losing any of those six points unnecessarily. Then, and that is explicit. Under the definition of appropriateness of language, you see, um, them saying tone, make sure that your tone is appropriate. But then kind of implied is also, it's also under relationship building. Are you respectful? Are you attentive? Are you non-judgmental? And are you showing empathy to the patient? And all of that is actually part of tone in English, okay? So what tone does not mean is how loud or soft you speak. Um, loudly or softly you speak. Um, people have different volumes. As you know, you have two or three minutes um, at the beginning of the speaking session where you just chat with the interlocutor. And that chat, yes, it is to get you relaxed, but it's practical. It's, it's, it's also to understand, do we have to adjust um, the recorder up or, uh, or turn it down because your voice is loud? Me, I naturally have a loud voice, but I deal all the time with students who are a little bit softer. So you just adjust the recorder. Tone also does not mean always agreeing with everything the patient says. As a matter of fact, you are likely going to get, as one of your role plays, some sort of conflict, either disagreement or having to persuade or motivate. So it's not about always agreeing. And it is also not about saying, I'm so sorry to hear that every single time the patient says something. Um, a lot of the students do this because they're so worried about not expressing empathy. I say, do it twice, okay? And that's it. Otherwise, you're wasting time and you're wasting words. Saying you're sorry, when you could be getting on with information gathering and information giving. So what is tone? What does tone include? It includes things like being professional in how you speak, but also being approachable. And that is from the beginning, greeting the patient throughout and throughout the interview. Again, it has to do with the natural rise and fall and pitch of your voice. For example, the difference between asking questions and making a statement and the difference in your tone when you're giving good news versus when you're giving bad news. Um, I'm gonna go through each of these. Um, appropriate choice of vocabulary to suit the patient or the caregiver that you're speaking to. Then it's also about sentence structure that, oops, there's my typo again. Um, sentence structure that is sensitive um, especially when you're dealing with difficult topics. 
And there is a, a language culture that we have in English. It's called hedging language. It's a little bit of adverb use. It's a little bit of tone. It's a little bit of how we put the sentence and being polite. But I'll show you some examples of that. Hedging. And then the opposite is how we use our voice and our words for emphasis to discuss points that you really want the patient to pay attention to. And um, this is another part of, of English speaking culture. We call it intensifying language. Okay. So let's look at them one by one. What do we mean by being professional but approachable? So let's look at greeting the patient. Now you could say, morning, how can I help you? Or, so what is your problem? Grammar, perfectly fine in both of those sentences, but the tone, it's abrupt. It doesn't kind of encourage the patient to open up to you. Better is, hello, my name is Dr. Banfield. May I have your name, please? Or, good morning, Mr. George. I see that you have returned today for blood test results or for follow-up. So the first one, of course, is more appropriate for a new patient. Whilst the um, second one is if the role play makes it clear that you're following up this patient or seeing this patient again um, for the second or third time following up an issue. All right. Um, and in case someone asks, and I know they're going to ask, if it is not clear from the role play card that this is a new patient or an old patient that you're seeing again, go um, opt for it being a new patient. So if you're not sure, the role play situation doesn't make it clear, like it's a GP's office or a home visit or whatever. Um, Go with the first one, always opt for introducing yourself. But if the role play card makes it clear that it is a follow-up visit, you want to show the examiners that you understand that this is a follow-up visit. Um, being professional but approachable during the interview is, you can say things like, is there anything you are especially worried about? Or feel free to ask me about anything you're worried about or not sure about, okay? So both of those are friendly. It says, I'm open, um, ask me, but still you're professional, as opposed to, for example, saying, you got any questions? Which is kind of abrupt, okay? Natural rise and fall in voice pitch. Um, there are some cultures where they have a natural, even tone for their voice. I live in Northern Germany. Um, it happens. And there are other cultures as well. But in English, that rise and fall also gives um, the listener information. So, for example, at the end of a question, our voice tends to go up. Whereas at the end of a statement, it tends to go down. And here's an example of the same words, but one's a question and one's a statement. And in speaking, it sounds like this. The medication is working well. The medication is working well. That's a question. The medication is working well. That's a statement. The medication is working well. So you don't want to confuse the, 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 um, the listener. Um, and they're going, are, are you asking me? Or are you telling me? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, okay? This is why tone is important. And just your intonation can be inviting or discouraging uh, um, to the listener. So here's another sentence. I can say this in two ways. One that's encouraging and one that's discouraging. Feel free to ask me anything you are worried or not sure about. That's encouraging. Feel free to ask me anything you're not you're worried or not sure about. Just that flat tone, it's not very discouraging. So just remember that. Appropriate choice of vocabulary. Now, yes, you do have to simplify your, very, your technical language so that the person understands. For example, your stomach might feel a little upset, but this will pass, okay? 
But you don't want to talk down to the patient. You don't want to be so simplistic that it sounds as if you are, you know, talking to somebody who's simple minded. Um, your tum tum might be a little not okay, but don't you worry. That's not appropriate either. So it's that middle ground. And remember, there are some technical words um, that the general public um, understand. So for example, you could also say your stomach, your abdomen. 99% of people on the street know what abdomen is, okay? Um, so talking about that hedging language that I mentioned, part of English language culture is generally is to cushion the blow of bad news um, or um, when you're delivering conflicting information, information that might be different from what the person has said. Um, so here's an example, giving bad news about results or diagnosis. So unfortunately, so you could say, of course, yeah, oops, wow, there's another typo, pretend you didn't see it. Your test results are not good. So you could say your test results are not good. That's abrupt, that's abrupt. That is going to put the patient kind of, of course the patient in real life, a patient can say to you, okay doc or okay nurse, give it to me straight. But this is for the exam. Better is, unfortunately, your results are not what we hoped for, but there are options for moving forward. So we start with a little cushioning word there, unfortunately. It tells them it's bad news, but it's gentle. And then we tend to, to try to tack on very quickly the good news. But there are options for moving forward, okay? Another kind of heading, hedging language is in situations where you're disagreeing or correcting wrong information. You could say, no, that's wrong, or no, you're wrong. Better, start by trying to find out why they've got the wrong information. Could you tell me why you think that? And then when you're given the information, I can see why you might think that, but actually, or, but in fact. And here you also score some points with incorporating the patient's perspective. So now you're not just scoring on the two criteria, you're scoring on the three, okay? And then there is emphasizing um, language, that intensifying language. Now, stressing certain words in English is also a, a, a way to point the patient where you want their focus to be and what you're saying. And there are two ways we do this in English. We either use intonation, as we mentioned before. An example, in managing your diabetes, diet and regular exercise are important tools. So the listener, here's diet, here's regular exercise, here's important, that's what they focus on. But another way you can do it is actually using intensifying adverbs or you know, strong language. In managing your diabetes, diet and regular exercise are especially important tools. And there we've actually used vocabulary to focus, okay? So those are two techniques um, that you can use when you're trying to emphasize speaking to the patient, okay? So just um, to wrap up, as I said, it was short and sweet. English um, speakers get information both from tone as well as from the words you use. And this is why tone is part of the OET criteria for appropriateness of language. This is why. Um, so how you say something is important as what you say. So yes, you want to get that information given an information gathering, but watch your language. Um, because not just in OET, but remember in healthcare, in your profession, you're always going to be dealing with sensitive topics. So, and, and people who are already worried about something. Okay. And also another point to remember is that the examiners cannot see your body language. So you have to use your tone to help um, show or reflect your care as well as your language skills. Okay. Um, 
I'm not, again, I'm not saying be overly dramatic. You're not on stage. You're supposed to speak naturally. That is one of the instructions. Please speak naturally. But at the same time, remember those subtleties of language. Um, and uh, yeah, you should do well and score maximum points with tone. All right. So that's it for me with respect to the, oops, the presentation. Let me just close down here. And now I will go back and I'm seeing all your lovely comments. And um, good, you've got a full half hour now for the comments. So let's go down. Um, once again, for those, guten Tag, Alvin. Yeah, jemand um, spricht Deutsch mit mir. Toll, super. Ah, and sometimes I must admit, um, outside of school, I speak German so much that sometimes students would ask me, what's the English for this word? And I do have to think about it. That's horrible, isn't it? Anyway, right. Um, oh, okay. So someone has gone a little bit off topic. And they said, I'm already working in hospital in the UK, but my listening is not really good. Um, I'm all right. Do you have suggestions for me to solve your issue with listening? Here's the thing with listening um, in the listening subtest. And people who want to talk about speaking, just bear with me a minute different um, listening A, listening B, and listening C require actually slightly different techniques for knowing when to listen, knowing when to write, knowing when to answer, knowing when to read. They do simply because of how the paper itself is structured. So in working with your teacher, instead of, um, and this is how I work with my students, instead of just going, okay, let's look at the listening paper. I actually break it down and go, okay, let's look at the skills, um, the configuration, uh, the layout of the listening part A, let's focus on those skills. Let's look at part B and see what issues you have. And then again, part C, because the, saying you have difficulties listening is a big thing. They might, there are lots of reasons why people have um, problems with listening. So it is for you to work with your teacher and find out what specifically your problem is, address those problems, get you over the hump and move on, okay? Let's see, um, good morning. Hello, Shandrika, yeah. So, um, all right, I'm not seeing any more comments. So does anyone have any other questions or, or um, oops, sorry, I just turned off <laughs> comments that they want to share with me. Um, now is a good time to ask. Or is everyone so super happy? Um, oh, okay. How about the remarking system? Okay. Remarking, yes. Now, sometimes you get the mark, especially, I know it's especially hard for people who, for example, they get, um, you know, 400 in their speaking, they get 390 in their listening, they get 380 in their, their writing or reading or whatever. And then in their speaking, they get a 340 or 330. Should you ask for a remarking or not? That's not a straightforward um, thing. Can anybody ask for a remarking um, from OET? Yes, you can, anyone. Should you ask for a remarking? It depends on your circumstance. What uh, we tell our students is, um, well, for us, it is based on our knowledge of our students. So if we've been working with the student and we know that the student pulls in usually a, a strong 370 or 380, 
um, we tend to push our, our students to score 380 with us um, so that there's some leeway there in exam under pressure. If we know that our students consistently perform well with us and then they get a 340 say, and they ask us, should I ask for a remark? I'll be honest with you, we say it's worth a shot, especially if um, your other three are a pass because we know you, okay? If, however, their score for speaking was 300 or 290, then something was, something happened. Maybe their anxiety got the best of them. Maybe they did not understand the role play and didn't realize. Okay. Um, in that case, when it's such a drastic drop from the 350 you need down to maybe a C or whatever, I would say it is highly unlikely that your remarking is suddenly going to shoot you up to 350. But again, the best person to ask about if you should ask for a remark or not is your tutor because they know your work. Okay. Um, you sometimes interchange and an und. Ich weiß das, oder? Ja, ja, das ist immer ein Problem, Alvin. Yeah. But here's the thing about und and an, Alvin. In the real exam, I don't think the examiners are going to come down hard on you for und and an. First of all, it sounds so much like an, anyhow. Um, and second of all, if the rest of your um, speaking is fine, and that is the only or one of the two errors you make, don't worry about it too much, Alvin. Okay. Good afternoon, Lakshmi. How to do it? Oh, Priya, sorry. Okay. Please give some tips on listening and reading part C. Oh, Bia. That, those are two, oops, sorry, my camera is very sensitive. Sorry about that. Um, Bia, that's, those are two huge topics. Um, tips on listening part C. What I would say is this, for listening part C, work with your tutor on understanding how the speaker and or the speaker and interviewer speak and the rhythm. Because actually, the listening part C is not as random as you think, okay? It's challenging because they are, of course, um, to test certain skills that you have. But actually, there are a few patterns to the listening part C. And if you know those patterns, um, or, or yeah, you get to recognize those patterns, it actually becomes a little bit more comfortable when you're listening um, in the part C and you don't panic as much um, because you recognize, oh, okay, all right? The best person to guide you on that because it does take some insight is your tutor, okay? But just so you know, if you understand the, the trends in how the listening part C is set up, that will help you. Um, with the reading part C, honestly, oh, I really need to stop moving. Yeah, there you go. Um, with the reading part C, I must confess, that's a little bit more challenging. That comes down to two things at their basis. One is your ability to read, to scan quickly. Skinning, scamming, um, your ability to read. Well, actually more. It also comes down to having a good wide vocabulary. I am sorry. There is no way around um, a good vocabulary and a good understanding of idioms in doing well on the reading part C because everything, almost everything is restated in the question and the options. So you've got to be able to recognize that what the question says or what the option says looks like something in the text. And the only way you can do that is if you've got a wide enough vocabulary and a wide enough knowledge of idioms. 
And that of course comes with time. And the tip for that is read. I know people don't like to read. I know people only like to read, be, you know, we're in the age of text and what's not, but nothing, absolutely nothing is going to help improve your English faster and better than reading English regularly and speaking regularly. With the reading, even if you're just doing five minutes a day, doing it regularly is more important than doing a big chunk once a month. And when it comes to listening, listening to lots of different kinds of speakers, lots of different kinds of topics, so your ear and your brain get attuned to, to, to listening, okay? Um, emphasize on reading portion. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> Same thing, what I will say about the reading, especially the part B and part C, um, uh, Hashim, what I will say about that is this. Um, in addition, well, to what I just said, vocabulary, 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 speed, speed, speed. There are no quick fixes. There are no tricks that you are going um, to get to get around to finding the right answer because um, OET, the questions in the part B and the part C, again, they are heavily restated, heavily. So if you don't recognize that one statement means the same as the other, you're going to look right over the answer and not realize it, that it's right in front of your face. Okay? Um, so yeah. I know people hate to hear that. <gasps> Reading. It's not a quick fix. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, if we have a little knowledge about the topic, obviously we get nervous and pop. Oh, oh, if we have little knowledge, yes, we get nervous and pause. Um, would this reduce the score? Okay. Um, I am so sorry. You have a beautiful looking name and I'm afraid to say it because I'm afraid I'm going to completely mess it up. But your question is, if we have little knowledge about the topic, obviously we get nervous and, and pause um, a lot more or a lot. Would this reduce the score? What examiners are listening for in your speaking is, yes, are you pausing too much, but also why you're pausing? Because think about it. Even in your native language, you pause before you, you say something, right? Um, I do it in English, uh, I do it in, in, in speaking, we all do it in speaking, even in our native language. However, when you start speaking again, your language flows once your language is good. If that happens in the speaking, then the examiner knows, oh, this short pause is simply because the person is gathering their thoughts. Because when they start back, their language flows quite nicely. In that case, they see that it is a pattern of your language. So this is not something they're going to strike off marks for. However, if you're pausing a long time, they're going to think, what is causing this long pause? One, you're wasting time. And you know, the clock is ticking. And two, is it because they do not understand or they're having difficulty understanding the role play? And if they pick that up, then yes, you lose marks. And then the third thing is when you do start back speaking, if after that pause, you start back speaking and tell me um, you have, um, you, you go to, you start back speaking and your language structure is not um, good, then they know that your pause is because your language is not as good as it should be. So in summary, not all pauses are equal or are looked at equally, okay? If it is just a short pause to gather your thoughts and then your words flow smoothly, fine. If it's a pause because you don't understand and it's obvious or a pause be because you're fighting to put sentences together, 
that's a problem. You will lose marks on that. And again, with respect to um, not understanding or, or not being familiar with the, the technical topic, diabetes or you know, Martin's neuromas or, or Sabaria or something. Um, again, don't worry about your technical knowledge. It is your English. If you just use the information that is on the card and fill it in with nice language structures and change and reword, um, but include that information, don't worry about not being a specialist in that area. It's your language and your reading and your understanding and your speaking, not your technical knowledge. Do I get penalized if I finish all the tasks? If I don't finish all the tasks in the time constraint? Um, the instructions, oh, my camera again. Hold on, give me one second. And we're back. Um, the instructions that you will get um, will say use the time to complete as many, as much of the tasks as possible. So if there are five points on the role play card and you only get to complete five in the five minutes, but you complete those five really well, you should get your marks. If, however, you've only covered two in the five minutes, that likely is because you went off topic or you spent a lot of time hesitating and looking for words or, or you know, whatever in which case you do lose marks. So if you miss out one point here or there on the role play card, don't panic, don't panic. Just ensure that what you do cover, you cover well, but yes, don't waste time. Move smoothly without rushing the patient, move smoothly through the points, okay? Um, could you please tell me about the task order? whether to complete in order or not. Good question, Deepa. You don't really have to. You don't really have to go in the order on the task um, on, that is listed on the role play card. You don't. But what you do have to do is, because what are you going to do if the interlocutor mentions something suddenly that's in point five when you're only by point two? What do not ignore what the interlocutor says because then you definitely will lose marks. Um, what you want to do in that case is answer, acknowledge that point, deal quickly with that point. Um, oh, but doctor, um, do you have any brochures that you can give me? As a matter of fact, there are lots of brochures that are available um, to deal with that topic. But before we get to the brochures, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with you now. And you go right back to point two. So you've answered them, which shows the examiner that you are listening, that you're paying attention. So you score marks under um, relationship building. You answer that by very quickly by saying there are lots of brochures. So it shows your information giving, you score marks there. And then, but then you go right back, then maybe to the second point or wherever you are. And go, but let's talk about this first. Tell me some information, give me some information about X, Y, Z, or tell me about what's going on with you now. And you score points under structuring, okay? So with that little zing zing, you've kind of impressed the examiners under three different um, areas, okay? So yeah, the most important thing is um, one, listen to what the interlocutor has said and respond and two, um, guide in, in your next comment and then guide them back where you want them to go. Um, how much our native accent affects our way of speaking? They expect you to have an accent, they do, okay? However, 
what is more important than accent is pronunciation and clarity. So work with your tutor, work with um, a friend, record your speaking, play it back. Let somebody else listen to it. Let somebody else listen to it. Is my pronunciation clear? If the other person says, oh, I can't understand what you said here or what you said there, then you need to focus on pronunciation. But accent, they expect you to have an accent. Don't worry about it. Um, why most of the candidates getting stuck with 340 in speaking? Is there any particular reason? Yeah, the reason is because they didn't score enough, unfortunately, to get 350. OET, on the OET website, you will see um, the OET descriptors for speaking. You can just Google it, quite frankly. Um, the OET criteria for speaking. And you also see what you would get a band three, four, or four, five, six, whatever. Um, in speak, it could be anything that pulls you down. A lot of times um, it is because maybe you, your, your grammar interrupted or distracted from what you were saying or confused what you were saying. One or two grammar errors, okay, especially if they can understand your general meaning, but if it's repeated. Um, what, what could be other reasons? Again, pronunciation and a lack of clarity. You have an accent, fine, but your pronunciation isn't correct. So the examiner is going, eh, I can't quite. So if you're, the examiner is thinking, I can't quite understand, or their grammar is um, not quite up to scratch, okay? Or this, in what they say is a little distracting from the topic. Yeah, that, that, that could be pulling you down. Okay. Um, uh, no 10. Hello, unfortunately. I'm going to assume you're from Turkey. Unfortunately, I can't read Turkish, but I'm going to, I'm thinking that you're saying, hello, you're from Turkey. Welcome. Um, I, mentioned, I, I spoke already about the part C, um, good points, thanks for the, you're welcome. Okay, if I don't know anything about a topic, can I just be honest and say general idea and refer to a GP, Hans is asking this question. OET will not put you in the position that you know nothing about the topic. If you, Go back and find any of the speaking role play cards. It doesn't matter. Um, at least once in the task points, you're going to see some information that's in brackets. Okay. Again, OET knows. They know that there's a chance that, yes, you are a nurse, but maybe you work in an intensive care unit and you know nothing about foot care or you're a psychiatric nurse and you know nothing about, you know, caring for a surgical wound or caring about for a chronic ulcer on a diabetic's foot. They know that, they know it, yeah? So what they do is they give you any technical information that they want you to include, they put it on there. Drugs, because they know you might not know all the drug names procedures because they know you don't know all the procedures. Um, they're going to put it, and if you look at any random um, card, um, you're going to see information in brackets. And the information in brackets is the technical knowledge that they want you to either include and or put in simple language and tell the patient. Okay. So again, yeah, I'm picking up that this is a common issue that people are worried about. Be, you know, what happens if I don't know the topic? Seriously, don't worry about the topic, worry about your language. Or don't worry about your language, focus on your language. And as a matter of fact, with your tutor, 
in training or with your, your practice partners in training, you know what to do? Look specifically for speaking role plays where you are not familiar with the topic. The best way to get comfortable with an uncomfortable situation is to keep putting yourself in that situation. So if you're a psychiatric nurse, um, you know, find role play cards to do with herpes or <laughs> to do with diabetic feet or to do with, um, I don't know, some, some non-psychiatric. If you are an internal, if you're a general surgeon, find role play cards that have to do with psychological problems or have to do with weight loss or weight gain, yeah? Uh, or to, to do with nutritional advice and work with those role, role play cards. Um, and after a while, you start to see that, don't worry about knowing the topic, uh, about not knowing the topic. OET gives you the information you need, okay? All right, let's then, we've got time I think for one more. Hold on, my screen here is bobbing all over the place. Um, uh, yeah, don't worry about not being a specialist in that area, amen. Okay, so let's see. Oh, somebody's typing in the caption and we've got time going on to the screen before bobbing all over the place. Uh, what? We've got time, I think, for one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, the screen is, 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 is bobbing. Sorry about that. Hopefully you focus on what I'm saying and not the, the, the bobbing. All right. Um, can I exactly mirror what the patient says for clarification? Yes, but how you do it is like this. Honestly, you go, okay, you said blah, blah, blah. Do you mean blah, blah, blah? Okay. So, so the example, examiner doesn't think, oh, you're just using the interlocutor's words. Put it in a sentence that shows that you know you're using the interlocutor's words, but then rephrase it again. So you said you have cramping abdominal pain. Um, do you mean that your stomach pain comes and goes? And then the examiner goes, oh, okay. They're just confirming understanding. Okay. Um, okay, can you phrase it again? So you're coming out on the Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's me. Why, why are my captions showing up? I don't know. Okay, um, thank you for the input. You are more than welcome, Hans. Oh, we do have time for one more. Uh, okay. Well, I don't have anything else to say. If you guys don't have any more questions, then I will say that that's it. You guys have been a lovely audience, a lovely class of students. Um, how much about you? Yeah? I'm looking to make sure I didn't miss anybody with any um, pressing questions. Um, no, okay. All right, so on that note, then I will say um, goodbye. And um, yeah, I'll see you next month when I do my next uh, webinar. Um, I will pop back in and answer any questions um, in the, over the next two days that, any, uh, that people have to this webinar, which will be posted on the OET um, website. So um, if you do have questions that didn't get answered, just pop them in and I'll come in and, and answer them over the next year or two, okay? That's it for now. Um, bye everyone, have a beautiful day. Okay, bye-bye.